Um, over the last week, um, I had a chance to play with a lot of, of drawing trees and also drawing waterfalls. So I see people have some things here on trees and waterfalls. And so let me just um, show you a few of the insights that I got from uh, playing in Yosemite um, over the last week. Let me go grab my journal and I'll start with that. And then I'll break down for you kind of what were the techniques behind some of those treats. Trees, right. So I had a chance to, to go to Yosemite and um, just had so much fun. Um, I filled up this journal, um, it was about half done. And so um, I just, <laughs> every chance I got, I, I would run out and you could just, you know, spin around in a random direction. And yes, there's a beautiful landscape. I think I'm gonna draw it. Um, and it just made me think like, you know what we gotta do? We gotta beat this COVID thing and then just get our whole posse up there, find um, a way to kind of get, um, get ourselves a Yosemite retreat. I really wanted to be there with you folks. Um, I think we can make that happen. We'll try to figure out like what is the best low cost way to do it. Like maybe we take over the uh, Yosemite Institute and you know, have, um, you know, just give us a, a base for adventures. We're, we're gonna work on it. I think we can make it happen. Um, let me, um, don't worry, we can take care of this fuzzy. Um, focus. Um, so this is the, little journal I brought with me. Um, I like it because it's it's nice portable little little book. And um, this is the start of my Yosemite adventure. And what I'll do is just a few more adjustments of the system here. Um, want to do a quick sound check. Um, Avea, am, am I clear? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Excellent. Um, I'm going to make one more check. What about now on the audio? Is this better? Um, not quite as loud as you were a second ago and a little less clear, but we can still hear you. All right, so then I'm going to go back to the way it was. Yeah. Um, is this better now? Yes, I think so. Okay, great. Um, so here is um, a little landscape. Um, what you're seeing is ballpoint pen and watercolor. And uh, it was really fun because I got up before the, the sun came over the ridge and the moon was making its way across the sky. Um, here's where the first light hit on the mountains. So I, I was working at what are some ways of sort of suggesting these rock faces and there were a bunch of black oak, black oak trees that were, uh, had not come out into leaf yet. And they were a really dominant part of the landscape. There were conifers behind them. And that was the, the first day that I started playing with those. The, let me see for more of those deciduous trees. Um, this is a similar sort of thing. In this view here, there are deciduous trees along the side of Muir Lake. And um, also, I'll, I'll kind of break down in a moment what <clears throat> I was doing for suggesting those. Again, they were these leafless trees. I had similar leafless trees here. Uh, 
with conifers behind them. And um, I came up with a sort of a shorthand for handling these trees. Let's see if there's any other of those tree sketches. There's one. Um, I came up with sort of a, a shorthand technique for kind of quickly getting these deciduous trees in that I think was was effective and it was reliable. So I could kind of, without stressing like, oh no, I gotta draw a tree with all the leaves off of it. Um, I would be able to kind of get that in quickly. So why don't I start kind of breaking down what I'm doing on these little uh, trees. It's just done with a, this ballpoint pen. My current uh, favorite ballpoint pen is the Bic Atlantis. Um, and uh, it, uh, it seems to be doing a very good job. So all these are done with that that big Atlantis. Um, then we'll deal with some coniferous trees with a ballpoint pen and look at some little waterfalls as well. Um, you can start it off with um, a non-photo blue pencil. Um, what I found myself doing a lot out there in the field was putting down my non-photo blue pencil and just going diving in straight with the big pen. And uh, the and it, and it seemed to, to kind of work for some quick trees. So let me show you. Let's see, here we go. So what my my strategy on these trees is to look at the shape of the upper edge of the canopy. And what I do is I draw lightly in a little arc. And um, the tree, if it's got several little branching parts, might have kind of a sub arc in another place. And so what these are is, along the top edge of the tree, sort of these lines of where the little twigs seem to end. And on deciduous trees, rather than the, them, them being at all these different random heights, what I'm seeing is on a lot of trees, they kind of come up and it's as if, as if somebody kind of came along with the, with a, the, a bird came along with a hedge trimmer and just trimmed them neatly along the top. So I start with that line along the top of the tree. And then what I do is I feed from the top down. So I don't draw the, tr the trunk of the tree first and then out to the branches and then to the littler branches, to the littler branches. I actually start with the littlest branches and I work my way into the trunk. So it looks like this. What I do is I want to look at on these trees, are the branches narrowly V's or are they more broad connections? So I'll just glance up at the top of the trees and go like, okay, on these ones, it's kind of narrow. And then I just put my pencil along this upper edge and I am going to bring my line down. And then I'm gonna bring another line down and feed it into that first line. And I can do that again here. And then I'm gonna do that again here. And then I'm gonna do another line down like that. Then I'm gonna make another line down and another one that goes into that. And some of these are going to kind of come together there. Others are going to come together at a different point. And so you see, I've got this little line here, this one here, this one here. I've got these little sub branches coming in. And then I start to feed these together. So I'm going to take these two and join them together in a big trunk, right? And then I'm going to take this little side branch here and I'm going to bring it down in there. And then this is going to come down in here. And as I'm doing this, I'm regularly looking back up at the tree for to because I want to see, I don't want to just kind of get so lost into, into sort of my imaginary happy tree that I lose track of the way that this real tree in front, in front of me is branching. 
And so I'll sometimes, I'm gonna just kind of pop it over to the Jack cam view here for a moment so you can see me. Um, what I found myself doing in the field is I would sometimes, I'd be sitting there and I'd look up at the tree and I'd do this. I'd kind of close one eye and just sort of draw, air draw the tree. Like, okay, these little branches coming down, connecting into here, connecting into here, connecting into here. These ones are kind of coming down here and then they're connecting there, there. And so I'm, the tree's in front of me back there and I'm tracing, because I've got one eye closed, I can trace in the air. If you have both eyes open, you're either going to see two pen tips or two trees. So close one eye, one pen trip, one, one, one pen tip, one tree. And then I'm looking at the shape of the tree and I'm just kind of kinesthetically getting that into my hand. And then I go back down to my paper. I'm not having to follow it like branch by branch by branch because there's so many branches in there, I get lost in the woods. But there is, there's enough um, by kind of doing this, this kinesthetic thing, I can get the feel for the arc of these branches. And then when I go back to putting them down on my paper, it's going to feel like a cottonwood. It's going to feel like a, um, a black oak. So <clears throat> let me jump back to the share screen here, the thrill cam. So these ones, they're coming down like this. Now I'm gonna do the same thing out here on this. So these ones here, they're coming down here. These ones are coming in here. This. And so what I'm doing is I'm just taking these branches down and I'm pulling them into a trunk. Now I'm gonna take some of these and see which one of these kind of naturally, oh, those ones come together there. All right. And This one here wants to come down in here. And bringing those down here. This trunk come over out like this. Up. And what do I do with that little line there? Um, that's going to be from some other tree. Suggest that there's another little tree back there. So I, I like this idea of pulling the branches down rather than, see if I do it this way, this is what I used to do when I draw the trees. I would draw it in my trunk and I kind of go, you've got a major branch coming up here and then another major branch coming in here and it splits and then this one comes in here. And then I would start kind of coming out here. Um, but these kind of angles between these branches as I'm coming up, they don't really fit into this the same way, the same kind of nice way as, they, as I get if I just give myself an arc and I pull down from it. As I, I sort of feel like as I'm going towards the trunk here, this is naturally going to give me tree shapes that I that just sort of feel a little bit more Organic, and and it doesn't it doesn't take a lot of time. So these are just imaginary trees from sort of the land of Jack Mind. Um, but if you're in a place and there really are the real trees, um, your trees end up a lot more grounded in reality because you know you're looking up and kind of you're getting these sort of little things and you're kind of they, they will feel much more tree-esque um and uh 
because you're not just, you know, you're, 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 you're regularly looking back up instead of seeing what the real tree does. I'm also sort of doing the front to back thing here in this kind of stand of trees. I started with the ones that were the closest to me, a few big trees, and then I was just able to fit in a few more ones behind. I'll kind of show how that, that flow went. Um, here, just lightly, these trees are gonna go over someone with a couple with some broad tops and then Maybe there'll be some others down here with these ones are a little bit more different shape canopy. And then I'm going to start with the ones that are in front. A few kind of odd lower branches that kind of stick out funny. You look for those on your trees and they'll say, like, they'll suggest to you, like, try to make it this way. And I'm going to bring these ones down in here. And they're going to start to disappear behind this. But I want to imagine these things kind of, kind of coming together and connecting to a major trunk back here. And I'm now going to put in one more tree. We'll let, just let these ones on the side fade there. But again, pulling these down from the outside edge makes for much um, the tree just sort of seems to build itself in a, in a better way. That one's going to have a fairly tall trunk. Well, let's say there's a grove of trees that is back here. Then what I can do is you can just sort of suggest that there are some other trunks of trees that are back in there. Maybe there is. Into some sort of, so I can get kind of layered ballpoint pen woods going on without gutting, without going nuts. And what I did for color on those is the tips of the branches uh, may have a yellow color, may have a red color. So look at the tips of those bare branches. And I just put in a wet and wet watercolor wash of that general color up into those trees. And down below, that is um, some shadow violet color, just sort of, a, or shadow, is either shadow violet or, um, oh, let's not genuine. Um, I'm forgetting the names of my colors. Um, Ray Bonzo, help me out here. Uh, the name of the really rich dark brown color. Is that Bloodstone Genuine? Yes. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, the, uh, so I've got some Bloodstone Genuine um, kind of going on back there. It kind of makes for those dark suggestion of there are pines back there. And I'm putting those in some places kind of behind those trees. It makes you feel like you're seen through clumps of this woodland that's more pale. Um, here you go. So that is 
just a few uh, strokes of that dark color up there down here makes you feel like you're seeing past trunks of trees. The oak bare branches in the foreground are more pale. The coniferous trees in the background are lighter. I did this, a similar sort of thing just with, um, with pen here. Oops, not there. There we go. So I've got these trees in the foreground. <clears throat> and I'm putting behind them just sort of the shape of the coniferous forest. And a few places towards the bases of these, pushing in the dark of that coniferous forest behind them. So you get the sense that you're looking past these pale deciduous trees without leaves. And there are those dark conifers behind. So if I were to put that into something like this, then what I would do is I'm going to create a, I'm going to look at the shape of those kind of pine trees, the, the edge of the forest that's in front of me. And I call these kind of tree squiggles. Um, by the way, some conifer trees, the branches tend to point more down. Um, some, the branch tips point up. Others, like the white pine, the branches kind of come, and, and the fir tree, they'll kind of stick more out to the side. So you really, you want to look at what is the shape of, what is the shape of that forest that's in front of you. And what I want to try to do as I make this forest line is try not to get it to be too symmetrical. So I don't want them to be, that's pretty evenly spaced, see that? Bum, 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 bum. So that means I really want to make sure that the next one, that I'm going to break up that kind of space. I don't want them to be all evenly, even heights. So, and I don't want it to, to go like big, small, big, small, big, small, like make this one big, then it's going to be that, that sort of sawtooth thing. Um, so you want to make a forest edge that is, what, I, what I'll, I call it consistently inconsistent. And then if I'm just using my ballpoint pen, I'm going to add value, which is with cross hatching here. And it's coming down and it's stopping at the tops of those trees. And then down here in the background, in a few places, I'm going to bring down just a little hint of there's more of that forest that's behind you. A few places in this forest edge, I'm going to sort of make this cross hatching pattern a little bit more variable. Um, sort of a, a, a shadow back there makes you feel like, oh, okay, the woods are. We talked about before, the woods are lovely, dark and deep. At least it's not snowy anymore. So I get this sort of sense that there's some coniferous trees and they are in front, uh, behind these deciduous trees. That was a, a shorthand that I used for a lot of my 
kind of background trees. Let me just sort of jump back to a bunch of these <coughs> sketches. I had a kind of a consistent approach to that. Allowed me to, to be able to, to, to fill up an area of forest, not be kind of going, oh no, it's just tangle of woods. I really liked having those pale trees in front of those dark conifer things back there. And you notice if you look at, actually let's really just zoom in on this background tree business here. If you look at most of the tree shapes here, they are, these are just kind of, these don't really look like trees. These don't look like trees. But they're going to read as trees because this tree is here. See this one that looks like a tree? I kind of slowed down and I drew this tree because this one looks more like a tree. People will see this and then they're going to interpret this as trees. Similarly, having these little treetops over here just says to everybody, yeah, these are trees. So those ones got a little bit more love. And then I can get away with doing things like this. And people say, oh, those are trees because that's over there. Those feel like trees because that's there. Um, let me see, this was fun. Here is the, you know, backlit coniferous trees. I mean, um, deciduous trees. So it's just a, they pop out as lighter because I made the stuff behind it darker. And So let me just see if there's any other fun tree things before we switch our focus to the waterfall. I have fun. Let's go check out. You know, here you see the same general idea. You can get away with scribble trees if you have a couple of trees that are a little bit more, look, I'm a tree sort of a thing. So this stuff back here handled pretty loosely. But you have some stuff over here that where this looks a little bit more like a tree. There's, oh, people see like, oh, there's a trunk, right? So that, then people just see this stuff back here and our brain goes, ah, distant forest. I know what's going on. So those are small lines. Here's the size of the ballpoint pen for comparison. All right, let's switch our attention. Um, <clears throat> actually, if anybody has any questions about that, um, drop those questions into the chat. Ve, if you can kind of scan those and see if anybody has any clarifications that are needed on that little uh, uh, method with trees. Um, and let me, let's take a look at waterfalls on toned paper and on regular white paper. Um, there are some spectacular waterfalls up there in Yosemite Valley. And maybe I'll start just with the, we'll start with some white paper waterfalls. There we go. And I'll zoom back. All right. A couple things that I observed 
is that the waterfalls were more crisp and easily to observe at the head of the falls. The further down you get, the more they, the more they sort of fan out into, um, into, into mist. So on my line drawing of these, notice that the line drawing kind of, it's a line coming down and then it peters out. It goes dash, dash, dash. So that's suggesting that that waterfall is not going to come down. If you look in the background, there's some light purple pencil back there. I blocked in the shape of those waterfalls. They feel like bright waterfalls because I put dark stuff next to them. I want this waterfall to feel bright. It feels bright because I put this darkness right there next to it. If that was light value, this would not feel bright white. So something that's nice though about waterfalls is that they do this thing. Let's see if we get some more waterfalls. Um, Right. Um, the wet rocks around the edge of the falls, the, the wet rocks turn dark. And so you get to punch in contrast right next to those, to the, the falls. And that really makes it, it pop. I try to keep any modeling or shading on the falls themselves to a real minimum. In this area here, there's a slight watercolor wash coming across in here. And there's a, a little bit of some streaking up in here. But other than that, I'm going to leave the waterfalls just white. Um, the minute you get in there and you start drawing in water and the shadows on the water, you now have made one of the lightest things on your page really, really dark. So if you draw, if here's your waterfall coming down, so it comes down from a little crack in the rock here, and it, and it cascades down here, and there's all this water rushing down. Look at all that movement, right? You know, oh, well, I've just made my waterfall dark. So by getting in there and showing all that action, I've made my waterfall dark. On the other hand, If you, put dark next to the waterfall, then you have a bright waterfall. And just to help the viewer's eye, I will then look back at the rock and I'll see, are there fissures in the rock? Are there cracks in the rock that I can put in that help this not just feel like a big white wall? I want every, to help everybody sort of see this as this is a waterfall and this is some sort of rock surface. So I look for places where there are cracks in those rocks and I might be able to put some of those in. Um, so on this here, got a few vertical lines there. If that's what I'm seeing on my, my rock face, I can
And for the final bit of contrast, if there's uh, depends on what's down here at Yosemite Falls, there'd often be a, a depending on the angle that you were, there'd be a little cliff that would cut across here. From other angles, there would be trees. So I'm going to just draw in that little cliff, maybe put in some trees. And that kind of, then you get a sense of the scale of the falls because there's little trees there. You're like, oh, that must be a big waterfall. Finally, on some of these little sketches, I would put a frame on it just to sort of help envision where the, where the drawing stops. <clears throat> you can also bring that into the sky to different degrees. If I want to, I could draw a line across there. Um, uh, another thing I could do is if there are, uh, you know, if they're I'm looking up there and there are white clouds, I could draw those in. Um, you could also leave the top end of a box like this open to the sky. So a big part of drawing the waterfall is not drawing the waterfall. That's what we get here. Um, let me see more waterfalls. Here's more waterfall. So you can see on this one, there's a little bit of line work up here at the top that kind of gets, has lines that start to come down. Here's the edges of my waterfall. And then I'm giving up on the pen and just letting the tone take over there. Um, down here, down below, you see the same sort of thing going on. Here is the edge of this. Putting dark next to the waterfall pops out that waterfall. This waterfall, um, if I, I'm just gonna see what happens if I make the edges of this a little bit darker. This is a, a, a brush pen that's almost out of, almost out of juice. I think it's so out of juice and I'm not really showing anything effective there with it. But if you feel like your waterfall is not, you know, popped enough, just add a few little key darks around the edges of it. And that waterfall pops out more. So if there's any other waterfalls Here's a little bridal veil fall. Kept it really, really simple there in the background. Just two white lines, a little bit of hatching on the edges of it with a pen, and then coming in with a brush pen to make those sides near it a little bit darker. I did find that I really liked the very pale brush pens when I was out there. This is a Tombow brush pen. Um, 
Let's see if there are any other waterfalls down in here. Yeah, there's a big waterfall page. There's another waterfall. Yeah, let's just check out these waterfalls. Um, this one is working because there is um, the dark right next to the waterfall. And then on tone paper, you get to bust out your white gouache. For these waterfalls, you can see me doing exactly the same thing that I talked about before. You'll notice that around this end, you can see the ink lines starting to come down, and then they give way. And that lets the bottom of it be a little bit more misty. This was done with a brush pen, and I think a little bit of watercolor over the top of that. The white in here was white colored pencil. A white Prismacolor pencil. This little waterfall up right there. Punch in the dark next to the white and the waterfall pops out. This waterfall here, the same tricks that I was talking about before. You can see my pen lines fading out by this point. Well, could you um, raise it up a little? Oh, I don't think we can see where it was fading. Thank you. So you see the pen lines are coming down. And somewhere about in here, they give up. And then it's going to come down into the high contrast of the trees in the foreground. You get that light against dark thing going on, and that really pops it. It's no accident that these are intentionally pushed in darker. That makes them feel like they're in the foreground and gives you some nice contrast of sort of hard edges against that sort of softer tree happening in the background there. Here is the same thing happening with this big waterfall. We're coming over the top of it and you'll see that the lines along the edge of it become less distinct. And what do you know? There's some high contrast trees punched in at the bottom. Same bag of tricks. The other thing you'll notice on these sketches here is that these, um, these little landscape picos here are covered with written notes. And when you annotate your, um, when you annotate your landscape sketches, a bunch of the pressure goes off the drawing to carry all the weight. Um, just so compare the kind of visual intellectual interest of what's going on here. If we compare these, right, you know, here, like bright sky, no wind, no clouds, frost in meadow, incense cedars here, roar of Merced uh, River, song sparrows singing, um, ochre gray patterns in granite. What makes the colors rock stained black? What causes the dark around the falls? Not just wet rocks, dot, dot, dot. Uh, water in free fall, um, about six seconds to bottom. Um, you know, so you're, there's, I mean, it's the, the words really do a lot to carry the energy and the memory. Um, on another day, you know, I was out doing some sketches of stuff. And what you find is you kind of look at it, you're kind of like, oh, but there's not as much dynamic storytelling here, is there? Can you imagine if I brought those same kind of words into this? about all the things that I was seeing going on here. What had happened here, I think I was kind of got into something in my head said, like, you should be just like get yourself and then do some landscape drawing. And so I kind of got into the mode of landscape drawing instead of really observing everything and sucking the moment in. My memory of this moment is crazy vivid. My memory of this is okay much better than if I wasn't journaling. But 
this, my, I, this moment I've got for the rest of my life. So what was happening here in this meadow? This is kind of fun. This was just sort of standing in one place. This was here looking to the north. This is looking to the west. This is looking to the south. And this is looking to the east. So there's the four kind of directions of the compass. Um, one looking up the valley, down the valley, and at the sides. I had a waterfall and I had El Capitan. Hard to beat that. Can't wait to get out here with you folks. Um, this little landscape drawing here, it's got names of peaks, which is useful labeling. But I think that the observations tied in with the Nature Journal page, that's, that's so much, for me, it's more interesting to look at. This is a more interesting memory prompt for me. So it's cool for me to kind of come back later and think about, you know, when I do something that is just, um, just some, some landscape sketches. And then to compare that with what happens when I really get into the conversation of nature drawing. And a, a lot of what I'm kind of going on here is just my my memory of the moment, this is much more vivid for me than even than this. So what I'm doing right now is what we call metacognition. Metacognition is when you kind of go back to your journal and you notice how you noticed things. You're observing how you observed things. Um, and what I'm observing is that I was more in the moment when I was in this mode. And now looking back on it, I wish that this had the same kinds of comments and notes on it that would bring out the same sort of richness for me as this. So what that's gonna do is the next time I'm out in a place like this, I'll do more like this and less like this. There are some things that are fun about this. Like here's a cool idea. Here's a landscape drawing. And I picked a few spots along it, along it and just put in some frames. I didn't have to do watercolor of the whole thing. I think that might've felt overwhelming. But instead, in this one little sketch here, I picked three places and I made a little watercolor just in that. It's kind of a fun trick. You don't have to do the whole thing. So what I essentially am doing is in this big landscape, I'm finding some landscapitos, little moments along the side of that. Um, Ivea, did you see any questions pop up that uh, would be relevant? Um, Tracy was wondering what the number is of some of the light brush pens that you like. That is a good question. Um, this one right here, I've worn all the words off of it. It is their palest brush pen, and I need to go replace it. And there is, there's, they've got, in, in the brush pens, they have two different versions. They have the warm grays and the cool grays. And um, I was thinking about which ones I preferred. And so I'll show you how the, so this is the cool gray and this is the warm gray. They look pretty similar, don't they? This one here is a little bit more bluish, right? On the cap. This, this blue, this one here is the, uh, this is kind of fun. Its number is, oh, the irony of it, is N95. <laughs> See that? This brush pen is the N95. Um, that really amuses me. Um, so we'll just do a, 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 a test here. Um, The, this is the warm gray. And let's see, this is the cool gray. And so the cool gray has a slight blue tint to it. This has a slight warm brown tint to it. 
And I'm thinking when I go back and replace, will I be getting more N95s? Or maybe somebody can look up online and while this, before this class is out, we can figure out what the number of this tail one is. Um, it's, um, I think I'm gonna go back for the warm, the warm gray. And so I'm thinking that my brush pen kit will be a warm gray of the, the lightest color that they have in brush pen land. And then a middle tone. Um, and that will be, so you don't, I don't need a million brush pens. I can, I can make things darker with my brush pen just by giving it a few more layers. So that's the warm here, right? And I just went swipe, 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 swipe. And I get this value and this value with the cool. Uh, could you uh, um, raise the page up just, perfect, thank you. Um, DB um, says that they think that the um, other one might be N N89, possibly. Maybe N89. Okay, great. Thank you, DB. Um, we'll put a question mark for it, but perhaps this is N89. Nope, went out of ink there. Also, Cindy is wondering what the point size of your Bic Atlantis pen is. Um, I think it is their medium point. Let's see if it says on it. Big Atlantis. Actually, what I can do is I bought these in bulk. So I'll pull out the bulk carton of them. Hold on a second. Um, Yes, here it is. Um, I got a 15 pack. And I really like this pen. Um, so it's the Big Atlantis Medium 1.0 millimeter retractable. Perfect. And then um, Mary Larson has a really good question. Um, she asks, do you always find that you remember better with a combination of words and pictures, or was that just specific to this particular experience? Um, I, I, the, uh, that's a, 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 thank you so much for asking that because it lets me geek out um, on one of my favorite topics, um, which is your brain. <laughs> um, oh, sorry, that part of my, I'm losing my mind here in there. There we go. There's your brain. Um, so what's, what's interesting is that the part of your brain that is your, your visual cortex. Now, well, first of all, we used to, people used to think that the brain was really localized, that there are these regions that just did. There are parts of the brain that do more stuff in one activity than another. But basically, when you're doing anything, the br whole brain is lighting up and neurons are firing all over the crazy place. But there's a place back here that does a lot of your visual work, your visual cortex. And over here on the side is where your brain is processing a lot more of your language and stuff like that. And so what's interesting is that when you do this and this, you're using more of your brain you're triggering other regions of your brain to get involved in experiencing whatever it is that you're doing. So the words are good, the pictures are good, but they're fundamentally different brain regions. So if we are intentional about bringing those together, then when you are out in that place, more of your electric meat is engaging productively and actively with whatever it is that you're experiencing. And 
that work of attention in those regions is what's going to make your memories. So, yeah, I think that it is, it's a universal thing that your brain, when you are just working with pictures, um, there's not as much action going on as when you are cross training in your brain. So I can think you can think of the, the, the using the words, pictures, and numbers together in your journal. Think of that as cross training for your neurological systems. Are there any um, Oh, uh, the, uh, let's see. Yeah, oh, it looks like we've got a confirmation from Brian P Higginbotham. Ah, oh, Brian, I didn't know you were on the line here. Brian, thank you for bringing, uh, uh, so Brian is a uh, host of the, um, the our Central Valley chapter of the Nature Journal Club, also leads wonderful um, workshops. They're doing, um, he's got some coming up on, they've been messing with watercolor and, um, really critical fundamentals. Um, and he's suggesting that, yes, it he, think he says that uh, the warm gray is the N89. Uh, I, I thought it was just so much fun that it was, that this other one was the N95. And I'm almost tempted just to keep, just using this one, just because it's the N95. And now that has this whole new meaning for us. Um, but I think I do prefer the warm one, that warm to the cool. So I think I'm gonna go back to, to this one, even though this one has a cool name. Um, hey, uh, maybe what I can do is um, I'm going to bring um, Ivea and Brian back on here. Um, I'm going to add Spotlight. Hey there. Um, and now where is the Jack view? Oh, nope, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to add me in here, but change my camera. Um, let's see if we can find um, Brian and co-host him and then bring him in there too. Um, yeah, Brian, thank you so much for, um, for oh, there he is, ah, spotted him. Uh, add to spotlight. Um, so uh, Brian is one of, um, uh, he, he's also part of our Nature Journal Educator Community, and um, the uh, I, I just wanted to to thank both of you for the the work that you guys are doing to 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 really sort of flesh out all the corners of this community and sort of find out sort of meet people where they are and give them resources to start nature journaling from whatever point they're coming. Uh, to this from. Brian, do you want to tell any folks about classes that you have coming up? Sure. Um, as you've said, we have the watercolor session this weekend with uh, J.P. Panther, Marley Pfeiffer, and uh, Lori Maloney. So that's going to be a really fun session. Uh, Heather is Heather Krellen, who's some of you know, will lead a session the next week. And then after that, it'll be back to me. Um, and I think we're just going to play with the watercolor theme for a bit. So just go, I think we'll do the primary colors color by color. So we'll do yellow, then we'll do cyan, and then you know play around with it that way. So that's our schedule for a bit. Thank you so much. Um, Avea, any last, um, any uh, comments or thoughts for the community or announcements? Um, I think that the, the other thing, though, is knowing that um, as we get closer to everybody being safe and vaccinated and start to think like in the future about meeting up in person, now would be the ideal time while we're all really connected online to if you if you don't already have 
um, a nature journal community or chapter and that's local to you now might be a really good time to start organizing and finding people so that you can begin local chapter um, while we're all connected and so ask for help from us if you need help forming it um, look for people on on the nature journal club page on facebook to see if there's anybody who lives close to you use the amazing map on jack's website and um, if yeah, just if you have questions, ask us. Also, I talked to Marley about maybe having a Nature Journal show episode where he interviews people who have started their own chapters so that people can um, can give some advice on that, maybe a panel. So hopefully, hopefully he'll be doing that episode at some point. Um, that's the big thing. And, and you don't have to be a, a master naturalist or artist, or you can be a beginner nature journaling journaler and start your own Nature Journal club. All you need is some chutzpah. And the and then you get a group of people to go and come and you know if if you if you build it they will come i just posted last night on the map and made announcements uh on the facebook group um new yukon chapter of nature journal club and one in raleigh uh, uh north carolina and so they're 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 popping up everywhere um if there's none in your country be the first in your country um and uh, we would love to to see this this way of connecting with the world spread, um, and it's decentralized. Um, you do not need our, our 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 blessing or permission to do it. You just start it, and we will support you. We are are are, are there for you, and um, it's. It's ton of fun. You know how much fun it is to kind of like see people again, like the people you saw last week. You're like, I can't wait to see what what's up in her journal. If you, um, and when you're doing this live with real people, oh, it's it's even better. It's even better. What are you gonna say, Yvette? I am. I also had a, a thought to um, share. If your first meeting is online before COVID, you know, before you meet in, up in person, um, I have a suggestion that might help facilitate if you're looking for ideas for the first one. Have your own local pencil miles and chill, because then it takes away the pressure to have a lesson plan. You don't have to, to, to like be an expert in anything, or if you're nervous about teaching, you don't have to. Pencil miles and chill can just be you and whoever's in your local chapter get together on Zoom and draw together and chat together. You could, you could either do free drawing or you could have prompts. If that seems fun to you, make it yours. Um, and then that way it's a very low stress way of getting to know each other before you're able to meet in person. So just a suggestion if anybody's nervous about what to do first. That's a great idea. Thank you. Um, well, what we're gonna do now is we're going to jump over to the community cam and see what people have been up to. Um, we are going to, um, let's see here. Um, if you would like to share something, all you have to do is hold it up to your screen and then I'll see you're holding something up like Sandra is doing right now. Um, so Sandra, um, we're in a moment, we're gonna make it possible for you to unmute yourself. Um, I am bringing you into the spotlight. And you can now unmute yourself. Oops, maybe not. Hold it. Got it. Um, I'm working around my yard, and um, I have a friend who goes out and picks stuff and brings it into me. And then I, um, I'm trying to document the spring, but I have to work faster because spring goes so quickly uh, trying to get control of my war colors better I, I i love the little zoom in on the the blossom there on the gray piacinth that's a really good idea um to show that structure yeah it was it's so different yeah i was um happy with the helicopters. These are the spring helicopters that come from the sugar maple and the um, silver maples are in the fall. Oh. So we get, get two seasons of um, seeds on the ground. That's and 
really interesting. It's yeah, I think of yeah, most so many plants. So many plants. Um, so, so many plants do their um, I think of the, the the fruits being in the fall, but you're right, there are some that are spring seed dispersers. Willows, cottonwoods do the same thing. Those aren't coming out in the fall. Those those are wafting around in the springtime. That's really interesting. I've never really I, thought about that. Well, I am so allergic to cottonwoods. I was in Montana and I thought I was going to die until oh. somebody told me it was the cottonwoods. So, hmm. uh, but I, I have lots. Um, I have lots of willows, so I am also working on the willows. Now, um, Sandra, on the the blossoms here, um, I am really getting a sense of depth without the color being muted. Um, what are you using for shadows on these um, flowers here? I, I, I really like the sense of, of depth that we're getting here. Well, I did, I did start with a, with a, a watercolor, but um, then I started going in with some colored pencil and that's where I left off when it was time for your program. I'm just trying to get my watercolor skills back. Yeah, this is really cool to see. I, I, I get a sense of real depth in these. Um, it, it, it feels, I, I can feel those, those parts in the center really sticking out towards me. That's fun. Thank, to see. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for sharing this. Um, okay. And what color are you using for your shadow? What? Um, well, you know, it's a palette palette stuff. The kind of the, the gunk that forms along gunk, the side. Gunk. That's yeah. the word. Gunk. Yeah. That's yeah. The gunk is really useful. I like to keep my gunk. I, I often find myself dipping into the gunk on a regular basis. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. There's always a little corner of something available. <laughs> Great. Sandra, thank you so much. My pleasure. Um, now I am going to go to, um, let's see, if anybody else has something to share, hold it up to your screen. Um, I see Ray Bonto has his journal out. You wanna share something? Yeah, let's check out what's up with Ray Bonto. We're gonna jump over to London now. Um, uh, Ray Bonto, it is good to see you again. I watched the, uh, your show with Marley last night. That was really fun to see. Um, thank you so much for doing that interview with him. That was very inspiring. Thanks. Um, oh, well, um, so, um, I finished my previous practice book, um, so I'm on to practice book six. Uh, oh, so brand new practice book. Uh, I love the, 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 I see the, the watercolor studies going on here and pulling the value, the, the branches down in those oak trees. Oh, this is uh, cool to see. Uh, I didn't use watercolor. Um, is this your water soluble pencil? Um, no, it's a 12B pencil. Oh, how soft. Is it really fun to work with? Very, um, very fun, and it goes to eleven, as you can see here. <laughs> um, yeah. It's not so soft, but just as dark as you want it, which is great. It just smudges as much as it should be. Yeah, so that's that's so, really, that's a really wonderful dense dark. If you um, go like that, and you want to cover this with watercolor. It doesn't work like 2B. It won't let the watercolor go over it. Um, oh, so, so the water beads up on the graphite pencil there? No, uh, it's completely waterproof. Wow. Huh. That's really good to know. I, I love that rich dark, uh, that really punched in dark that you're able to get with that. That's, yeah. that's fun. Thank you. 
So, um, from the uh, well, um, from I think it was last week. Yeah, I did this uh, on Saturday. Oh, the 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 little toned paper uh, pieces taped in um such a good idea such a good way to uh to to bring toned paper into a standard white paper journal i love the collage effect yeah actually it was two weeks ago so um i hear a little cat walked by uh, so i sketched that <laughs> yeah. um here's a female dog yeah, it was somewhere else near the river. Yeah. And here I saw a, a mallard. Here's another mallard. Can, may I, uh, something that I see that I really like that's going on on your mallard sketches is a lot of people um, have this idea in their head that the mallard head is green. And so they um, grab their green paint or pencils and cover the mallard's head with green and bring us closer to those mallard heads so if you look at these i'm at least i'm i'm seeing there's uh blue purples in here um maybe a little blush of green but you're not just grabbing your green paint and dropping it in there you're looking at what colors you actually see when you change when you look at a mallard in a different angle of light they can look, the heads can look black, they can look purple, they can look blue, they can look blue green, they can look bright green, they can look yellow green. And um, the fact that you've got mallard sketches and it's not just, you're not, you're not going on autopilot, oh, it's a mallard, therefore I'm gonna put green on the head. You're really looking at the colors that you see. That's cool. That is really cool. Yeah. Man iridescent and uh, you know some birds like magpies or pigeons only hold um two out of three um shades of iridescent colors yeah mm. Mm. and then i came to uh, there was a water mill do you call it huh? what do you call it artisan. yeah artisan wheel yeah it it stopped working a long time ago, but. Oh, oh yeah, hold this, hold this close to the screen and then hold the, the it, it's still. Oh. I saw him sitting there. There was a little um, stone wall sticking out of it on the water and there was a heron sitting on it. That's really cool. This is, this is fun. Look at, uh, everybody notice how many different angles we've got going on on the heron here. So not just a heron portrait, but this view, this view, this view, this view here with the, the wind ruffling the feathers. We've got stalking, we've got resting, we've got um, uh, frames across the bottom with some flight poses. So really looking at this um, from so many different angles. Yeah, yeah. so... It was sitting still, sometimes docking its head, uh, doing hair and things, uh, uh, going slowly. But here was the exciting part. Now that uh, um, little wall was about that high compared to the floor. Um, yeah. Uh, if the floor is the water, is that high. Okay. Uh, um, then, uh, out of nowhere, it suddenly just dived down, struggled a bit, uh, it dived down, uh, struggled a bit, and came out with a fish, and came, and then came back. <laughs> oh, look at these action shots, folks. This is, so well, this is such excellent visual storytelling. Um, the uh, Ray Bonto, have you seen some of the journals of Tunnicliffe? No. Um, so um, British bird artist. Um, I'm going to go over and pull one off my shelf because 
I think you might be inspired by this artist. Um, there are some really, some interesting things that you are doing that remind me of Tunnicliffe. Um, so I found these in a couple of used bookstores, um, uh, sketches of bird life and a sketchbook of birds by by Tunnicliffe. Um, so I'm going to drop these over onto the um, onto the camera here and show you um, the so um, from starting in the mid 1930s for over 40 years, Tuncliffe spent most of his daylight hours observing and drawing and painting birds. So you have a connection with this bird artist. Check this out. Um, see, where are the... Um, so, you know, here is, oops, that's not in the frame. So these, these action shots of things kind of flying around. Um, and so here is the osprey, right? And it's, uh, where are we? So the osprey, it's flying around and then and comes up with its big old fish. Oops, nope, we're not on the screen. Um, let's try this way up, oh, there we go. So it comes down, gets the fish, and then flies away with that in its talons. Um, I'm seeing sort of uh, hints of and, and kind of echoes of, of, of Tuncliffe in your sketches there. There's this one that Tuncliffe did of, I want to see if I can find. Uh, my, my, my favorite drawing is this, this hunting sequence of, a barn owl. And I'm going to see if I can, uh, for some reason I'm not able to, to land on that. It's here, missing things. No. Maybe it's in, I'm going to try one more time in this book because if I can find this, this barn owl one, you'll be like, oh yeah, oh, this guy's my buddy. Um, but you'll recognize a bunch of your British birds here. Uh, oh, there it is, there it is. This, when I saw your, um, I thought of these sequences when I looked at that last page of yours. So here's the bird and it's coming down, swam into here. And then look at this flying off with the line drawings. So I'm gonna back up here. So coming down, here is the attack down in and then the flying away is just the line drawings. That's, I mean, visually, visual communication, that's really cool. But look at this one here. Um, here comes the barn owl, oh, it's hunting. Oh, it's looking down. All right, feet swim, swing forward, push down into the heath. And comes, oh, what does it have? And nom, 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 and it flies away. Let's zoom in on this. So uh, look at that coming down. Ooh, cur splat. Nom, 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 nom. Um, so you, do you see why um, what you're doing reminded me of, of Town and Cliff? So what you're doing is you, you, you're, you're looking at careful details and then you're also doing these quick gestures of the action and telling the stories of the behavior on your page there. Could we see that again? Let's hold it a little bit closer to the screen. Oh yeah, oh yeah. 
That's exciting. Um, Eva or Brian, do either of you have a comment, something to share? I was also enjoying the arrows to show the process um, that, that the arrows will show like what how the, how the story reads and how to follow it and and I'm just trying to imagine like how fast you would have had to sketch that to capture the whole story and 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 that or like just that maybe that you were really really focusing on the details and I'm curious to know while you were watching were you saying your observations out loud or saying what it was doing out loud no I don't usually do that um... Usually I tune into the words to talk, yeah. And uh, uh, I just did this from memory. Um, wow, that is really. Be, I mean, in the field, I did it from memory. That's great. That's that's the way we roll, Ray Bonto. That's the way we roll. That's yeah. cool. Then we came to some Canada geese, um, and it was a huge uh, trumpet. Uh, coming out uh, from a huge crowd. <laughs> I love the speech bubble. It's so expressive. Yeah, like, you just get an idea of the bird's mood. Now I want to be there to see what what kind of drummer they were getting into. They made it say that. That's cool. Uh, then I went to another park the next day, um, and um, yeah, I sketched a bit. And I saw uh, I, uh, we were sitting at one end of a place and uh, on a bridge. Yeah, where you could sit. Um, and uh, on the other end of the river, uh, there were some more. Uh, there was a little river, but the river was still going. Uh, I mean, it was a nearly man made river. So I saw a heron at the other end, so I decided to go over there and check it out. And I saw it. Also, catch a fish. That's cool. You know, you if, if you show up for nature, nature shows up for you. And it's, you see these things, people say like, I don't know, how is it possible that you're out there and you saw these animals do this hunting and stuff? It just comes from spending your time in the field and paying attention. And you also, by this point, you know the postures and the moods of the bird. So you know that when it's doing this and that little lean, Look, 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 because it's about to catch something. And watch out. Um, this is great news. Um, above us, there was a tree um, at the other end where we were sitting normally. And uh, there were heron wings coming out of it. I didn't, we didn't see the whole heron. And I saw heron make the heron, I heard the heron making noises like a woodpecker, making foot with larger. Uh, and louder taps. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah, so perhaps sort of bell clacking? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I didn't know what it was, it was doing at the time, but uh, I saw a heron fly out of the tree and it went away. And there was still the noises, which meant there was another heron there. And I went to a far end. And they saw they were nesting. You found a heron nest. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah, uh, I couldn't see the baby, baby probably because there were still eggs, but uh, um, I saw the heron at least. That's that's really neat. The, um, now knowing that site, bird, the herons will often come back to the same nesting site year after year after year. And so you can look in, in those locations and you can see all sorts of cool things. Herons go through these cool courtship displays. Um, the males will take a stick. They'll bring a stick to the female. Apparently, it's very attractive to a female heron if you bring a stick. And um, so there's, it's, um, and watching the little ones grow is going to be so much fun. So much fun. So uh, Tunnicliffe would also, um, you know, find chicks that you know, um, were, were growing and would follow nests. Um, and let's see if I can find, well, these are just some individual sketches of them 
um, you know, here's a, a, a little coot or a grebe chick, looks like a grebe. And the, uh, so following the, the plumages of the youngsters as they are developing. And if you have access to a nest, even better. Um, because then you can, you can go there and over, over time, you can watch the incredible changes as these things you know, go and get big and grow up. So what a, that would be a wonderful nature journaling resource. You now can get heron whenever you want. And I also, I also saw an Egyptian goose, uh, which is one of my favorite um, water birds. I decided to capture it, try to capture it in full detail and, uh, and I managed to. Let's see. Um, Oh, uh, see, the, you're really getting sort of great saturated colors. I like that you're work, working large enough to be able to put in all of this information. And that choice of the dark background to really pop that thing out just adds mood, atmosphere, and presence to this. Uh, yes, I just... Uh, the Egyptian goose is, uh, the Egyptian goose itself uh, was in the same position, but it turned, um, so I decided to turn along with it so it was at the same position, and I sketched a bit more of the, on the same one, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then it ducked his head, so I worked on the body. Uh, actually, no, um, I knew it had a rough head, so I just did that. I mean, I came uh, back to another place and um, painted it. Oh, that's that's really fun to see. To, to, are you going to show us the other sketch as well? Also, by the way, nice line variation. Yeah, I'll go for the rest quickly. Um, so I saw some ducklings here and also with a female duck. Uh, they were like that small, so yeah, and then um, I, I took a few illustrations of that crazy plant, that, remember that plant? Yes. Yeah, I did an illustration this time, uh, and um, then uh, I forced it apart and I saw they were holding dewdrops while hanging upside down. Oh, what cool structure. Um, have you been going to Avea's botany classes? No. Um, that, that, um, she's been doing these botanical illustration and, and dissection and visualization classes. Um, that's, this is really cool to see. I like how you're kind of getting in there and looking at the structure. And uh, yeah, these were some old pigeons out of squirrels and, and an additional, uh, I think it's a grape or called it. Um, they're quite confusing. I don't know what it is. Um, and then, uh, Kept on sketching pigeons and squirrels um, a lot, and finally, um, yeah. I saw this one with brown primaries, um, completely, and a bit of brown secondaries too. It's interesting. There's so much variation on those because there's been um, lots of kind of human breeding and selection for different traits. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Great. More. Uh, yeah. Ah, that that tree study is really dynamic. Yeah, completely pen, uh, not ballpoint. Mm -hmm. Um, just technical pen. Um. Yeah, I was getting a few pens. Well, I saw another 
squirrel. Oh yeah, it was the that previous game. I saw a squirrel and it just ran and it bounced on a tree and then ran. Oh. That's really fun. Hey, yeah. Thank hey. you so much for sharing those. This that's really cool to see. Thank you. Uh, wow. This is the final one. Uh, a crown imperial. It turned this clown turned out to be a crown imperial. Mm hmm. Yeah, uh, and isn't it interesting how after several drawings, you really get to know a species in a way that's really different than the first time that you you uh, you you start to draw it. But you really get to know something deeply by this kind of journaling and sketching. That's yeah. wonderful to see. Thank I you know. for sharing that. Thank you. I even saw a mouse. Yeah. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you. Well, thank yeah. you. It's really great to see you again. And I want to encourage everybody to check out uh, Ray Bonto on the Nature Journal show with Marley Pfeiffer. Um, I'm now going to jump over to, let's go uh, see our friend Walters in Latvia. Um, do you have a headlamp on? Um, looks like you're, it's, it's, you're up late. Um, good to see you again. Hi. Hi there. So, uh, hopefully you can see. Okay, so these um, these are just, uh, it have been uh, since, uh, uh, it's been a long time from the last class. I have been drawing quite a lot. So uh, these are goldfinches I know. from the, the, our side of the pond. Your goldfinches really take the cake for spectacular with those, the red on the head and all those patterns. That's what a complicated pattern. You really have to, to draw it and draw it and draw it before it starts to kind of fit together in your mind. That's cool to see. Everybody check out mm -hmm. all these different angles that uh, Walters is doing here. Um, so there's, you know, back, side, front, um, back view with head turned back towards you. Um, so I want to encourage people to, as you're seeing here, consider making a bunch of different pictures and split and rather than just one. Um, also, am I, are you putting in little color codes to get the colors in different places? So you, you write in the yes, color? Because, yes, because they are moving so fast. I have adopted uh, this kind of process that I usually, I just sketch them and I put the color codes and then afterwards they're gone or uh, uh, or I'm uh, drawing home over, then I do the watercolor. I have already written down uh, the colors. So that's why I, I kind of can get it faster and uh, uh, all down, so yeah. That's, that's really smart. So everybody take a close look on those pages. You'll see letters, letter codes in different parts of the bird's plumages. Mm -hmm. And so those are what Vultures is using to, to block in the colors in different places. And you really also now have a dynamic understanding of the front view of these birds and the, the, the back view. That's you, you really, you, 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 you get those angles. That's cool to see. Yeah. So now this is one of the nest boxes that I drew that I, this is for a uh, red start. And they have very special uh, kind of very, very thin uh, exit uh, that they need to oh. go through. So, yeah. And- uh, Cool. Um, I, I didn't know uh, about anything about sort of, so, so the, the, the red start, you need a very narrow slot. Yeah, so because they like to nest uh, in like cracks under the roof where they can kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, go into. And then if you have a hole in the nest box, they will, but they kind of, it's good if you adapt the nest box uh, as much to their natural nesting sites. So yeah, the very, like the place they go through is about this so uh, big. Yeah, and in height, so yeah. That's cool. Hopefully, hopefully some other sites there. And now, now I, oh, and this also, hi, 
uh, uh, break drawing birds. And uh, this was a lighthouse uh, in a destination that I went uh, watching birds. And I, cool fact, I discovered that uh, one, my, my grandmother's, my grandmother's uh, sister's, uh, my grandmother's sister's uh, husband was this uh, lighthouse's kind of the keeper. watcher, mm -hmm. the keeper, yeah. So yeah, always interesting facts to find out. Oh, that's neat. That's really cool. And and that that was also one where I can tell you're just like, I like toned paper, and that's gel pen, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is gel pen. This is gouache. Yeah. And this is gel pen as well. Yeah. Yeah, gel pen was made for that lighthouse. That's fun. It was, it was. So right now I am I, I am at my cabin, uh, near near a lake, not uh, at my home, and been drawing. Uh, we have a lake nearby, so reed buntings, smooths. I think they're called smooths. Yeah, yeah, but that's that's the the smooth. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, look at this. Isn't it also, it's fun when you kind of get a collection of like black and white things all on the same page, just by chance. Mm. The, um, oh, that is so much fun. Oh yeah, the smew, yeah. again, that's a bird that is made for toned paper. Yeah, I just go and geek out on the gouache. It's just, it's all over the place. Very, very fun to do these. And, Oh, this was also first time sketching like a non-bird. This was a, I think it's called Triton, Tri Triton, or a salamander. Yeah, salamander. Something like that. Yeah. So we had these, and uh, it was also very fun to sketch them. Turn this one turned out quite kind of good, so I like these a lot. Oh, it was uh, fun. Oh, fun! That is yeah. that's really fun. Um, and then is that a uh, green woodpecker I'm seeing down there on the bottom? It's not a green woodpecker. I think it's called a gray woodpecker. Gray woodpecker. This is a gray woodpecker. Yeah, green woodpeckers have all all green kind of heads. But okay. Yeah, I think this is green. It was pretty cool. I we have forest nearby, and it was only my second time that I had seen this bird, and it answered my call. I was uh, calling for a big male. At a start, uh, it's easy to call for a big meow with your mouth, and it kind of started to answer, and I started calling it, and uh, yeah, it just came flying through, and uh, all around uh, in the sky over me. So yeah, it was a fun time to sketch it. That's fun. So folks, what what Valtus is saying is that by imitating the pig meow, this woodpecker then came in to chase Valtus the pig meow away and to get it out of the area. You don't want a pig meow to take you by surprise, but if you know that the pig meow is over there, you can go in and if it's not surprising you, you've got a really good chance of driving the pig meow away. And so uh, you, you, you imitate the pig meow. Let's hear your pig meow imitation. <laughs> it's a, uh, mm, it's like, it goes like, <whistles> so, that is the call of the big male, but the woodpecker's call is more like. <laughs> so it's a it's similar to big male, but it it called from, uh yeah it answered to the big male's call, and then once I heard it uh, calling back, I just switched to the gray woodpecker's call. Ah, so yeah, you, when you heard it, you knew you had a gray woodpecker. You know that call. Yes, and I know it's call, yeah. Yeah, and today we, we were going on a little trip and uh, pintails, found some pintails. Oh, oh aren't those fun? Yeah, that's and especially, I like this one. This was only pencil, and I just love how I got the proportions, and this one is uh, one of my favorite drawings ever, so yeah. <laughs> It's neat, you know, how some, sometimes a quick drawing just captures, captures the gestalt, the feeling of that bird. 
Oh. Does. Oh, that's fun. That, that is such an elegant bird. That little white line going up the back of the neck. Mm. Yeah, that's some fun. That's a good time. Yeah, and there is also, um, I don't know the English name, but uh, uh, bird of prey uh, going over the water and all just the, all the pintails just uh, flew away at one moment. So that was the end of sketching them also. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That's cool. That and, is really cool. Yeah. And last, uh, last week uh, was the... Uh, bird, uh, birds in hand, and I was so inspired by what uh, Anne is doing and Point Blue is doing, and uh, their field station is so so cool and modern. You, uh, and it would it be possible to show in what we here in Latvia, uh, uh, just quick two minutes how in what we catch the birds and um, to we share a photo. We, we would love to see that. I've just brought on uh, Ann Chadwick here from Point Blue Conservation Science. Um, so here are, um, so he enjoyed seeing uh, what was happening at Point Blue. And uh, do, do you have, so you've got video or, or photos of no, your I process? Get, I just got like, I got like five photos that of the station, of the field station that we have and some birds that we have caught here. Ah, all right. I we would love, love to see this. Yes, Anne? Absolutely. I can't wait, Walters. Thank you so much for sharing this. That's terrific. Yeah, absolutely. I would love to share. And so, so. those of you who missed it last Thursday, Jack has already posted on his blog um, the recording from, from Thursday's session. And if you want to revisit and sketch note it, it's up there too. But thank you, Jack, for having us on. And now I can't wait to see what you've got. Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely do check it out it was next uh, so this spring i'm going to be turning to the bird ringing uh i'm going to be ringing the small uh, chicks from the bird uh, nest boxes and so yeah gonna be a lot of birds in hand and uh, get, good to know how to sketch them get to know how to sketch them Okay, uh, is it possible to share your screen? Oh yes, um, what I'm gonna do is I am going to make you a co-host with us. Um, you are now a co-host and I am going to give you the whole screen. So Anne, I'm gonna remove you from the spotlight here. I just thought you'd like to say hi to your fellow ornithologist. Absolutely, uh, thanks. Um, all right, so you, um, you should be able to share a screen now. So, are you, uh, just in a second, hopefully you are able to see the screen? Yes. Are you? It says you are sharing yes. the screen. Okay. So, and as I, if I understand right, uh, you catch your birds in mist nets? Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, cute. <laughs> this is what Whoa. we catch the birds in. Wow. Yeah. Whoa. So, oh, this one and this one right here. Oh, this is a crazy setup. So talk us through this. Talk us through what you're, you've got going on here. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, at the top of the image, uh, all the birds, um, it's quite, it's a, uh, we have it. Uh, we have a place that called uh, Papa, and it's Papa's ornithological station. And on one side, as you can see, is the sea, and in uh, you cannot see it in the picture, but there is a lake, and it's kind of like in a bottle. You know, it's it's a bottle. A bottle's neck is very narrow, and then it kind of gets wider at the end. And it this uh, place is they call it uh, the. Uh, water well the bottles effect where all the birds migrate uh, uh, by the shore and then they kind of get very very close together uh, to each other because on one side is the lake and one side is the sea so the the space where they travel is very narrow so they come uh, through the trees and and into this big big kind of openings where they 
go through these uh, nets and at the end maybe on the left bottom corner you can see a small box there is so they kind of go through this whole net into the end box and at the very very end where we collect them so that's the whole big net and then they kind of gets tinier 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 and tinier so like that yeah that is that's that is really really cool yeah and uh, we also from uh, the pop ornithological station is also working as same as uh, point blues field station from 1966 yeah. Huh. wow yeah that's when i was born <laughs> that's right <laughs> what a coincidence yeah so uh, this uh, so also oh fine this is a gold crest but uh, usually we we also have mist nets there but those mist nets are uh, for like rare species and owls and birds of prey um, but also yeah songbirds also get into them so this is a gold crest that we have here yeah and uh, it's so cute. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a uh, it is the tiniest bird in Europe. It wow. is the tiniest bird in Europe. It's very very large, and its rings are like super small, super small. So, oh, and this is the pygmy owl. Oh, look at you! Ah. Yeah, we uh, usually the owls and the birds of prey we catch in. Uh, Miss nets, I don't know why, but they don't go in the big net usually. So, yeah. Oh, and also, as you can see, well, yeah, this was a bird. <laughs> this is a, this is a, this is a um, male sparrow hawk. And uh, he, wa he went into the big net. So, yeah. Always good to see these birds. This is just the ringing station that we have a small home where we have uh, all the things we need to ring, the rings, the pages, the measure measurement tools. So yeah, that's uh, about it. This is a uh, great spotted woodpecker. Those also come uh, not so rarely through. So yeah, well, that's a short tour, short tower tour of our uh, field station. These are these are the homes where the scientists live. Oh, this is so cool to see. Uh, <laughs> that's exciting. Uh, you know, I we should, uh, it, it'd be fun to to do a nature journal workshop similar to what we did with Point Blue with your team out there. If uh, it'd be, be fun to kind of go through the the process so it might be if, if you're interested uh, send me an email and we'll try to yeah. set something up um kind of a deep dive into this this process and and what's going on how did you personally get started with um with with uh ringing oh uh well i was bird watching for a very long time and it I just started, uh, I started bird ringing, yeah, it was last year, last year, that was bird watching, and I just kind of uh, wanted to do something also useful to get to understand the birds more, and I wanted to uh, work with the birds and uh, help science to understand the birds, so I, I just uh, knew, I just knew of this place, and uh, I knew also the guy who runs this place. So he invited me and uh, yeah, just uh, started there. And uh, uh, probably this, uh, this year I'm doing the nest box ringing uh, with a friend of mine, but to do a ringing on your own, you need a ringer's license mm -hmm. uh, here, but, uh, but uh and so when you uh, need a ringer's license, you usually go to this place because each day, mm, in, in a good day, I think we're like 
400 birds wear a ring each day, maybe more, yeah. if I remember correctly. So a lot, a lot, a lot of birds. Uh, what, I mean, this is, this is just providing such critical data. That's wonderful. You know, you give me hope for my species. Um, yeah. This and is, oh, the better part of human nature that we're seeing right here that we have the, the, the capacity, the intuition, the will, the desire to understand so that we can protect and make the right decisions. This gives me hope. Give. Yeah, we, the, the lake nearby also, um, I don't know the English name of it, but uh, oh, it's, uh, uh, we have a songbird there uh, who nests in reeds and it is Europe's most rarest songbird. And it's a very critical breeding site. Uh, the papa is a very critical breeding site for them. And uh, yeah, it's a, also this uh, field station. We also put nests, uh, mist nets around the, the lake in the reeds. And we try to get some data about those birds. It was a, yeah, it's the rarest songbird uh, and most endangered in uh, Europe. Mm. I don't, I, sorry, I don't remember the, its English name. Yeah. Oh, that's, this is really exciting to see. So yeah. can I ask Walters just two quick questions? This is Anne again. Um, yeah, first of all, sure. is that structure up year round? That, that big net structure? Uh, no. Showing? Okay. Mm, this structure is put up in August. And uh, yeah, it's for, uh, so, it's for uh, autumn migration. Uh, on spring migration, sometimes ornithologists go there and put up mist nets, but not this big uh, structure. Um, this is on the on the top side of the uh, on the top side of the picture is north and down is south. So, yeah. Mm. Uh, it's a uh, when this structure is put up when the birds go from north to south. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yeah. And then my second question is: once we are past the pandemic, can can we come and visit you there? Oh sure, sure. Okay, good. Yeah, that's actually uh, a lot. A lot of um, scientists from uh, other countries, uh, Switzerland, and a lot of uh, scientists from Germany and uh, Great Britain, Norway, uh, all over uh, all over the world come to this station because we have this big net. And it also, in night, it also catches bats. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, that's something also that a lot of scientists come and uh, come and observe. Yeah. What is the name of the bird um, in, 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 in German or in, in, in Latvian, what is the, the name for the bird that you use, the really rare one out there in the reeds? Oh, uh, hmm. I, I can write it in chat. It's quite hard. Uh, its name in Latvian is Griechlukautis, but yeah, it's, uh, it's gonna be very hard to write. Uh, I, uh, after I do this, I, I will uh, write it just quickly in the chat. Oh, cool. Oh, this is, this yeah. is really exciting. We, we got to talk about doing an extended version of this and uh, connect with some of the, the, the scientists out there and you um, out at your research station and do some more birding. Yeah, definitely. Oh, mm, and this, so cool. this, uh, this guy checked the nest box out. So yeah, <laughs> things are going one, here. Is, is that one of your nest boxes? Uh, yeah. Ah. That's exciting. That's really exciting. It really is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Nicholas was wondering if the bird could be called the aquatic warbler. The aquatic warbler. You know, that might be it. Yeah, that might be it. It sounds familiar. Yes. Yeah, so, I, yeah, I think that might be it. Mm -hmm. It might All be right. it. Yeah. Oh, this is this is really cool. Yeah, we 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 gotta connect. Um, we'll we'll talk. So, ladies and gentlemen, you will be hearing more uh, from Walters and the research station. Um, before we go to uh, somebody else, I wanted to show you something, Walters, um, that 
um, I thought that you might be interested in. <clears throat> Check this out. Um, some of the, um, I, I, we, we took a look at Tunnicliffe, which reminded me of some of the things that Ray Bonto was doing. Um, what you are doing reminds me of some of the, are you familiar with um, Keith Brokey? The- uh, uh, No. Check this out. Um, so this is um, this this whoops. Let's zoom back. So here's the book, One Man's Island by Keith Brokey, and he's he's a Scotsman, kind of a young fellow, um, with a sketch pad, a journal, right? and um, he spent time on an island, and um, they had one of those same sorts of traps on that island. Here's his diagram of the trap structure. And um, so let me back up for a second. What's cool to see is that he's drawn a bunch of the birds in the hand. And so you can see, um, so here's, you know, here's, uh, he's, he's, he's ringing birds. Um, but then makes drawings of them. And these are some of the sketches. Let me back out. Um, sketches that he, you can get this kind of detail with the bird in the hand. So close up of the head, um, you know, looking down on the head. Here, real careful studies of the, 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 the wings and how the the, the, the wing lengths look on these birds. Some of the cool ones, I think are the ones where he, you actually see his hand in it. So check this out, toned paper, bird in the hand, um, and so you can see, uh, this is really um, the, uh, uh, this little note here, this vicious bill, more reminiscent of a falcon's, drew blood from my finger in a moment of carelessness. So you gotta be careful if you're banding the strikes. But let's check that out. So um, here are, he's kind of drawn in his hand using the birder grip. And there is the bird around it. So that might be sort of something to, to think about when you've got these birds in the hand there might be opportunities for, for doing that. Looks like he's adding the color later. And the reason I think that is if you look very carefully, he's doing exactly the same thing you are. It says olive green, a little line pointing down here, light buffy green pointing to here, um, buff pointing to here, legs pale brown. So he's, he's, he's doing the same sort of thing um, I'm, I'm going to zoom down so you can see some of those little notes. I don't know if you can see these. Yeah, these are words saying the colors with lines pointing yeah. to parts. And I thought that you um, might be, I'll make that a little bit bigger. There you go. Let's see if there's a, a few other birds in the hand. So yeah, so these are uh, more bird in the hand. What was this book called? It's called One Man's Island. Okay, one case, Brookie, One Man's Island. Okay, yeah. Um, so here is a cuckoo in the hand. And so he's getting sort of side views, details of the foot. Um, Here's a little uh, gold crest that has died. Um, let's see if there's, there's a few of these others. Yeah, so these are all done from you know, birds in the hand where you can kind of get this crazy time detail. Um, so I thought that that might be um, you know, from as, as a bird ringer yourself, um, might be 
some inspiring ideas of directions to go in your journal. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, yeah, this this fellow is really fun. So this part, back part here, these ones that you're seeing, these are kind of from from dead birds. But he also does some amazing field sketches. Um, and so the the book itself is a real inspiring look at a number of different strategies for drawing birds. And again, using that toned paper so that you can pop your whites. All right. Um, thank you so much for sharing that stuff. That was really cool to see. Sure. Um, Anytime. So um, let's see if there are um, any other journals that people wanted to share. Um, and let me see here. Um, all right. Well, um, let's jump over to Ivea. And then we'll close it out there. That's Spotlight. Brent, again, thank you so much for helping host and, and uh, support these workshops, as well as Pencil Miles and Chill, and the uh, Botanical Illustration and uh, the Fun with Veggies series. Thank you. I'm extremely excited about the about week eight's class because it's going to be a family I hadn't meant to do um, because we thought it was too difficult. but. I have faith, so this is going to be really fun. What, what, what family are you going to do? Oh, it's a surprise. surprise. Actually, I'm going to think of it, I can just tell you because- No, no, no. we can make it a surprise if you want. I like it as a surprise because then people, they go in without expectation, so then people have to come with a fresh mind, a beginner's mind, if they don't know in advance what family we're looking at. So that's why I like to keep it a surprise. Great. Um, just, I'm, I don't do as much detail, but I found something that I'm kind of addicted to doing recently. I don't remember if I shared these already. Um, but when I'm low on time, I like to do a quick um, inventory in whatever location I am, where I just quickly sketch and then color in um, whatever whatever flower is flowering um, during the day, which is kind of fun because you don't have to go too much into detail. But then, and at first when I sketch these, I think, oh, well, you know, that doesn't, they don't look very distinct. But then when you see them next to each other, then they kind of stand out. So I've just, this is my newest addiction. And then I did one recently for the garden. The last time I did oh. the garden was months ago. So um, so this has been kind of fun just seeing how things change um, over time. But then this one excited me because this was at, um, nearby my restoration site. So a bunch of these are ones we're gonna have to pull out, um, but this will help me because then in the future I'll be able to see what time of year they flower. And eventually we'll be able to try to take them out before they get to that point. Oh, that's um, one one that is just beginning to flower on the bike trail is conium maculatum which is the poison hemlock mm -hmm. but it's not yet flowering at my actual site so next week we're planning to take it out or well, actually this week we're planning to take out the rest of it so that it doesn't get to that point because then once they flower and fruit then you're going to deal with it for a whole other year and some of these guys stay in the seed bank for a super long time so out out of the branch itself the branch is sending down little rootlets and rooting in those positions yeah, as long as it's as long as it's making contact with the ground. And in gardening, sometimes if you have certain plants that do that, you can take a gardening stake and stake it so that the so that the branch itself is on the ground and then eventually it will make roots and then that way you have cuttings um, from that one. So that's really fun. Um, just discover that. And then uh, the last thing is that I was trying to do a landscape eat though, and I think I went a bit overboard on the green, but then again, that's kind of like the green took over my page, but to be fair, that's what the Cape Ivy does to the site. So I'm like, yeah, okay, this is about right. <laughs> and and um, also look at how effective you're by pushing your values. This is a great example of what happens when you're willing to take the risk of pushing your values. Um, and the, the darks in here, you, you really can feel like you can go back into spaces. It really gives this so much depth. That's really cool to see. 
Thank you. And thank you for encouraging me to push the darks. That's what helped you, you teaching me that. So thank you. Oh, that's really fun. <clears throat> well, my friends, we are about to turn off the recording. So thank you all for being with us and sharing. This was a fascinating share, share, share session. And um, just so glad that all of you can be here with us. So if you are inspired. Yeah, Ray Bonto had a question. Ah, um, let's bring Ray Bonto back on for a question. Um, hi there. Uh, yeah, uh, what's the brand of your sp stopping skills? Um, the, the, the brand of my, my little one? Um, so, one, uh, one that can fit in a small backpack like that. Ah, so you want the Vortex Razor. It's, it's, it's a little, um, right, right now it is, it's, it's out in the back of my car, so I can't go and get it. The, the spotting scope that I now recommend, um, it is, it's a very small, lightweight, portable one. I think I may have a link to it on my website. Let me just go to uh, uh, supplies and equipment. Um, yeah, my, um, my, my, my current favorite thing, the thing I like the most about this spotting scope is that it is super portable. Some spotting scopes are heavy. And um, yeah, so if you go to, um, let me uh, put in the chat a link to the page. Oops, um, I want this to go to everyone. Um, so I uh, just put a li li link to the chat to uh, something on my website that has um, hold on a second. My computer is doing the spinning wheel of death. Oh, there it goes. Um, here we are. Um, so if you go to that link, you will find, you know, this is my, my you know, description of these are a few of my favorite things. Um, so here's my raindrops on roses, whiskers, kittens. Yep. Bright picker packages, all those sort of things. My, the binoculars that I like are the Pentax Papilios. Those are the ones that are available for purchase on my store. The spotting scope I do not have for sale on my store, but this is what it is. It is the Vortex Optic Razor HD, that number angled spotting scope, blah, 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 blah. Right. Um, and, um, you can get a lightweight tripod with it. And it's a very lightweight spotting scope. And um, it, you, with a large spotting scope, you're not gonna want to haul it up to the top of that hill. But this thing's so lightweight that it is not a problem at all for you to take it anywhere. Um, so when I travel internationally, I, throw it in my, my, my luggage. When I go, you know, for any sort of walk in the woods, it's easy to bring this thing along. Um, the really heavy scopes, you start to kind of make this judgment in your head, like, yeah, not today, not today. Um, it's just too, too heavy, too much of a hassle to bring with you. Uh, you know, what you can do, yeah, I have a telescope, and what you can do is put your binoculars on the tripod and you can use one eye. Uh, only that I, I think a spotting scope might be easy and you can't carry a huge yeah, telescope tripod. Yeah. It's a bit heavy. It's a bit, but if you've got dad there carrying it for you, <laughs> uh, <laughs> then, you know, you've got, you've got it made. Um, so as, as long as you've got dad there, um, uh, pulling that for you. It's kind of useless in uh, London to watch the stars, to be honest. Yeah. Yes, that's right. That's right. Howdy, it's absolutely useless. You'll be lucky to see the moon. Yeah. So it, it, with, with, uh, with, with city lights and then add a little bit of fog and you're, you're done for. Um, yeah. All right. Um, so 
Um, I'm now going to turn off our, our uh, group recording. Hey, everybody, thank you all for being here. Um, it is uh, really wonderful to, to see you here in the community.